Section 20 of The Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Empire of Business. Section 20. The Long March Upward if man had been created perfect but with an instinct for his own degradation and if he had fallen so low in the scale as to become unfit longer to live then indeed his future might well be despaired of but when we know that instead of this he has developed slowly from the lower orders of life constantly ascending in the scale century after century for many thousands perhaps millions of years moving steadily towards perfection we can indulge in the confident expectation that there can be no retrogression. We behold him and exclaim, quote, What a piece of work is a man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculty! In form and moving, how express and admirable! In action, how like an angel! In apprehension, how like a god! End quote. Only through exceptional individuals, the leaders, man has been able to ascend. He is imitative, and what he sees another do, he attempts and generally succeeds in doing. It is the leaders who do the new things that count, and all these have been individualistic to a degree beyond ordinary men and worked in perfect freedom. Each and every one a character unlike anybody else, an original, gifted beyond others of his kind, hence his leadership. Men are not created alike. On the contrary, there is infinite variety, not only in the powers bestowed, but also in their degree. For the fruits of men's lives depend as much upon the amount of the same powers shared with others as upon different powers inherited. The earth was at first only a ball of fire thrown off from our sun, no life possible upon it till it cooled millions of years probably elapsing before a green leaf could appear then after vegetation arose came a life from the ooze of the sea and finally from the higher order of life there was developed primitive man of whom the veda remains our nearest type described as living in trees and crawling down to feed on what he can find unable to walk upright until he gains more food as summer advances man lingered long in the savage state and like other wild beasts his chief occupation was war upon his kind eating as well as killing his captives subsequently he developed into the barbaric stage not quite so much of the wild beast he began building huts sometimes cultivating the ground always improving upon never permanently falling so low as his predecessor after unnumbered years of such storm and stress we of today have become more civilized, more peaceable. The arts of peace, not those of war, our occupation. We have reached the industrial age with its problems. This we are called upon to study and discuss, never fearing that the power within us, which decrees unceasing improvement, will not enable us to continue to tread the upward path. We shall make mistakes as usual but the human organism feels its way surely, though slowly, drawing back its tentacles whenever they touch deleterious soil, groping again until fertile ground is found, and then the next step forward is taken. Thus the organism never moves far until the right path is discovered. It is on the constant search for nutriment, and discards all that is injurious. If it now and then swallows an indigestible mouthful, it promptly spews it out. Hence its constant march onward and upward. It has never met a difficulty which it has not surmounted. It bears a charmed life. All this Herbert Spencer has clearly revealed. It is a healthful sign when there is unrest and dissatisfaction, and zealous, even extreme, advocates of change clamoring for better things in quicker march. Divine discontent is the root of progress, and even our socialistic friends, with their revolutionary ideas, stir the waters for good if we reason soberly together and test their proposed remedies before we forsake the path which has so far led our race upwards from the brute to civilized manhood. 
by the nature of its being, the one rule which the human race can never persistently violate is that which proclaims, quote, hold fast to that which has proved itself good, end quote. Complaint against our socialistic friends is not that they do not mean well. On the contrary, no class is moved by worthier impulses. Their hearts are in the right place, and one cannot but sometimes admire their aspirations. Thus Keir Hardy writes, quote, Surely it is reasonable to hope that a day will dawn in which a desire to serve, rather than to be served, shall be the spur which shall drive men onward to noble deeds. There is perfect agreement on two leading points of principle, hostility to militarism in all its forms, and to war as a method of settling disputes between nations is the first. End quote. George Eliot says somewhere that she could imagine a coming day when the effort to assist a fellow being in trouble would be as involuntary as it now is to clutch one stumbling and in danger of falling to the ground. Such hopes and aspirations are not confined to socialists. They are held by hosts of good individualists. Let these be freely indulged. Under individualism, the race is ever developing the generous impulses. Altruism grows as time rolls on. Never was civilized man his brother's keeper to such an extent as in our day. Socialistic conditions are not required to produce healthy growth in this direction. Where we differ from the socialists is as to the advisability of any violent change from individualism, which is guided and is still guiding in the direction desired through the continual improvement of present conditions. We believe that the surest and best way to obtain more service from men to their less fortunate fellows is by continued evolution as in the past, instead of by revolutionary socialism, which spends its time preaching such changes as are not within measurable distance of attainment, even if they were desirable in themselves. We feel that socialists neglect the immediate duty of their day and generation, and vainly attempt to provide for a distant and unknown future of the race which alone can determine its own wants in its own day. Their revolutionary outbursts alarm the timid and conservative, and hence threaten to delay and perhaps to frustrate for generation many desirable advances, which the moderate wing of their own party ardently desire, especially in Britain. The extreme socialists themselves are one of the obstacles to substantial progress today. On the other hand, the timid and conservative must not fail to remember that grave and unjust inequalities prevail in connection with the land. Non-taxation of site values, plural voting, and unequal electoral districts in Britain, also in taxation not according to ability to pay, and unequal distribution of wealth common to all countries. And they also should remember that the surest and indeed the only way of ensuring a contented people is promptly to recognize and redress these and other evils. It would be futile to indulge the belief that the masses of Britain will much longer be content to see their fellows in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and America enjoying free land without primogeniture or settlements and sites taxed at true values equality of voting power through equal electoral districts, one man, one vote, payment of members, complete control over the liquor traffic, yearly licenses at high rates and freely cancelled, and local option rapidly spreading. Equality with their fellows across the seas must soon become the cry, and the sooner this is granted, the better, that the steady march of evolutionary development, so fruitful in the past, so necessary for the future, may continue to hold peaceful sway in the land where freedom broadens slowly down. The pace of reform for some years has been much too slow as compared with progress and ideas. The day is coming when kindred institutions shall prevail in all the nations of our race, that which proved advantageous in one being promptly adopted by all the others. Thus shall be laid the foundations of a lasting and beneficent imperialism of race, whose influence in the councils of the world, always pleading for peaceful arbitration of disputes, will lead to the reign of peace and the brotherhood of man. One parting word to our well-meaning but, as I believe, 
misled Socialist friends. To be born to honest poverty and compelled to labor and strive for a livelihood in youth is the best of all schools for developing latent qualities, strengthening character, and making useful men. Hence from this school have come our leaders. It is well that man should go forth to his work in the morning and labor until the evening. Work is no punishment. It is a blessing. Steady work is also the best preservative of the virtues. No substitute for it has yet been found. Man has not been placed in this world to play and amuse himself. He is entrusted with a serious mission, and has onerous duties to perform, not to a future generation, but to his own. And he who fails to labor for the improvement of this, our own life of today, does not deserve another. To advocate speculative schemes for a future of which we can know nothing is folly, and worse, for the revolutionary ideas so rashly proclaimed by the socialists alarm sober-minded conservative men and drive them into the ranks of those who oppose the salutary reforms needed in our day, which could otherwise be easily won. Socialists evolutionary, socialists halfway, socialists revolutionary. We are here to attend to the pressing wants of our own age, not to obstruct the steady, orderly march of progress by basing action upon the startling assumption that in a distant and unknown future individualism, under which man is steadily advanced, is to be supplanted by communism. This is to lose the substance by grasping for the shadow and waste our time like children chasing rainbows and crying for the moon. End of section 20